north side. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It is so good to be on this side of Zion just one more day worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. O oh, most wise and gracious Father, we come to you just one more time, Lord, just to say thank you. Lord, we come to lift your name on high, to give you all of the hallelujah praises. Lord, we just want you to know that we love everything that you do for us, seen and unseen. Lord, we just thank you for always being there for us when no one else is there. Lord, we ask that you come into this service today, Lord, and just have your way, Lord. Don't let the rocks cry out for me, Lord. Just come in and just go from heart to heart and breast to breast and just give your holy praises. Lord, we will be ever so careful to continue to give you all of the honor, all of the glory, and all of the praise. And it is in the name of the matchless son that we say, amen. to take just one second for all of our older women to just raise your hand. You look beautiful. Oh my God. Look at this. Look at this. Oh my God, my God, my God. See, to the younger women that are in the building, I remember when. But now, as we are maturing and getting a little older in grace, we are beautiful. We are beautiful. I just want to acknowledge that, hey, y'all, we're in the house. Amen, amen. Now for the reading of the scripture this morning. I'm reading about final instructions this morning. And the word is coming from the theologians, the fifth verse. And I'm reading from the 12th to the 18th. And it reads as, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. 
live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you and Jesus Christ. Amen. your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you, O God, my God. 
Please join me in the singing of our hymn of praise, hymn number 532, Lift Every Voice and Sing. If you're in the sanctuary, there's a hymnal in the pew in front of you. If you are online with us worshiping this morning, you will see the word on your screen. Thank you for another chance to be together virtually and in person. Thank you for this faithful fellowship, this worshiping community, this beloved band of believers that we call Northside. Thank you for the deep faith, the grace, the hope and love that you pour out on us and that we share with one another. Now we pray, O oh God, 
that you will take our weary years, our silent tears, that you will bind them together in your great love and strengthen us for the journey ahead. For we ask it in the name of Jesus, your Son and our Savior, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In response, we say, I feel like going on. I feel Amen. Good morning. A couple of weeks ago, I got home and my wife said, what do you need? I said, I need help in worship. That's right. That's right. And thank God that we have a team of preachers who can step in and just help us take us higher in our worship. Amen. Dr. Thomas, God bless you and thank you for sharing this day. For those of you who are joining us virtually and online, we welcome you into the worship service of Northside Baptist Church. For those of you who are worshiping with us in person and it's your first time or maybe your second time or maybe your third time with us, we are delighted to have you with us. Want to ask that all persons who are joining us online, if this is your first time, would you please raise your hand online so that we can know you are with us? And if there are persons in the room for whom this is your first time worshiping with us, or your second time, or your third time, we invite you to just wave at us, stand so that we can see you, so that we can welcome you in the Northside way. Amen and amen. God bless you and greetings to each and every one of you. Every Sunday it is our practice, it is our habit to say the vision that God has given us as we seek to be God's people in this place. I invite you to say it with me together. Northside Baptist Church is intentional about making and growing disciples and empowering people to live changed lives. Amen. And for this year, year 2023, our theme is very simple. It's two words, God first, taken from Matthew 6, verse 33. A couple of announcements. Of course, we want to remind you that Bible study takes place on Wednesday at 12 o'clock noon on the Zoom app. Last week, we had a wonderful time and a wonderful discussion, and we were able to record the conversation with Professor Gorman. So if you would like to share in that, please let us know, and we will make the recording 
of Bible study from last week available to you. It was a wonderful time of questions and answers and give and take. Also, please be reminded that on Monday and Wednesday nights, we will have our prayer calls at 6.45 p.m. We are grateful for the band of believers who gathers on the line so that we might lift one another up in prayer and to celebrate what God has done in our lives. Saturday morning at 1015, Hand in Hand has its time together in prayer. And of course, on Sunday mornings, the Sunday school lessons begin at 930. And I've been telling you that our Sunday school curriculum involves the wired word. And today's discussion was the conversation we need to continue to have. And that's about what happened in Memphis a few weeks ago and its implications for those of us who are believers and who know that justice is still not available to all of us. Please be mindful as well, uh, young people in our church of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation has scholarship applications available. If you know of someone who has expressed an interest in somehow following in the footsteps of John Lewis and others, Shirley Chisholm and others who have helped form and shape policy. The Congressional Black Caucus is a wonderful place to learn how that happens and to raise up the next generation of congressional leaders. And so those scholarships are available, those applications are available, uh, and the link online is um, being shown on the screen even now. Okay, so today is February the 19th. Christmas was December 25th. And there are still a couple of saints whose Christmas cards were brought by somebody and they anticipated you picking them up. Today is the last day. We're going, if whoever does not pick up Christmas cards today, uh, we're sad to say you will not know that you got them because this week we're going to need to move on and move forward because we begin Lent on Wednesday. Ash Wednesday is this coming Wednesday, and we will be spending focus time in prayer and discernment of God's will for our lives. Let me say thank you to the five Northside disciples who joined with your pastor on Thursday at the Greater Harvest Baptist Church for the press conference. Thank you for coming. We posted a couple of pictures on our Facebook page. It is called a page, right? Facebook page. On Facebook... Uh, Y'all got to help your pastor. All right, I just, Facebook and I are not good friends. Um, but thank you to those men and women who joined us to lift our voice and to say to our mayor that we must do something about the housing situation in Baltimore. We must do something about all of these abandoned and empty and rundown houses. In fact, Thursday, our press conference took place, and those of you who were there will be able to certify this. One house has been vacant so long that a tree has grown in the house and was visible above the roof line of the house. That's how long this house has been vacant and we can, we must, and we will do something about it. Let me also say that um, our trustees had a wonderful meeting yesterday uh, and we are aware that you are waiting on statements. Some of you who have requested them, you are waiting for them to arrive. We promise you we will get them to you as soon as we possibly can. We converted over this year to a new system. And um, as with anything, technology is great, but only when it works. Um, so we will get the statements to you shortly. Lastly, um, let us continue to remember the devastating earthquakes that happened in Turkey and Syria earlier this month. Uh, our goal, our challenge is that we would raise $1,000 as a church to send it to the American Baptist churches so that we can witness with our money that we believe that God is still using us where there are situations where people are hurting. So if you have, if you have not yet given or if you were trying to figure out a way to give above the tithe and above the offering to support people whose lives will be forever impacted. 
Uh, we invite you to do that through Northside. At the end of the month, we will cut one check, we will send it, and we trust that God will use it to help those who are in trouble. Those are the announcements that we need to lift up before you today. We thank God for those of you who are joining us online. We pray that you will feel some of what we feel in this place. We pray that you will share with others that you are worshiping with Northside online. And if you are joining us later in the week on our YouTube channel, we bless God for that and we thank God that you are sharing with us. It's time for us to worship God with the giving of God's tithes and our offerings. Amen and amen. I am always delighted and amazed, right, that whatever God allows one of us to give, when we put it together with what God allows everybody else to give, what a difference, what an impact and what importance it has in the lives of those to whom the gift goes. We not only give to support those who are in crisis, we give because God has given freely to us. We thank God for the opportunity to give. In Northside, there are two ways you can give. First, through the Givelify app, which you can find on your phone, on your device. Just go to the App Store, find Givelify, Look for Northside Baptist Church and you can give there. Or, as many of the saints continue to do, you can mail or bring the tithe to the church in the tithe offerings or however God uses you to give. When we come to this moment, we have a habit that we are in. We lift towards heaven the gift we are giving. We lift the device which allows us to give, and even if we're not giving anything today, we lift our hands as a sign and as a symbol that God is using us, and we make a statement about our gift, and I invite you to repeat it after me. Divine love, through me, blesses and multiplies this gift. It blesses the receiver and returns to the giver, blessed and multiplied. Amen. Let us pray. God, how we thank you for the gift of life, health, and strength, and the ability to share how you've blessed us with someone else. Now, God, take that which we give. Allow it to advance the work of ministry. Allow it to meet needs of people who are in trouble, who are facing crisis. But most importantly, God, allow what we give to help the kingdom move one step closer to being what you would have it be because of us. We thank you, God, and we offer this prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our music ministry will come and we will return as soon as they have blessed us with the offering that is theirs.
Amen. If you are able to stand, we invite you to join us in standing as we turn to the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, the first chapter, and I'll be reading verses 15 through 22. Exodus 1, verses 15 through 22. Whether you have it on your tablet, whether you have it on your phone, or if you are carrying the Bible, Exodus 1, verses 15 through 22. As you are able to locate it, please say amen. amen. Also, if you do not have your device, you may follow along on the screen. That is both on the front of the sanctuary, but also on the broadcast. And we are grateful always to our tech team who keeps us looking better than we deserve to look. Amen. Exodus 1, verses 15 through 22. Hear the word of the Lord as it comes to us from the New Revised Standard Version. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Puah, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. I read in your hearing the troubling words that come to us from Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 22, the word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will never return void. Touch now this, your servant's lips. Touch this, your servant's stammering tongue. Allow that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, we pray. Amen. For the time that is mine today, I want to talk as the Lord allows about when we obey God. When we obey God. One of the great lasting truths of the Bible is pretty easy to say. That is that we must obey God. We cannot call ourselves believers. We cannot call ourselves Christians. We cannot call ourselves disciples. We cannot call ourselves followers. We cannot call ourselves Jesus people or whatever other title you may want to lay claim to if we do not operate under this understanding that we must obey God. There are no two ways about it. It's unswerving and it's unavoidable. Now this word obey comes with a whole lot of baggage that attends to it. Most of us are comfortable with a working definition that sounds something like this. It means that we will comply with a command a direction or a request and or we will submit to the authority of the person we are obeying. Obeying is one thing. Obeying God is another thing altogether. We humans, right, have had an interesting some would say difficult history and a challenging relationship with obeying. And in particular, we have had one old hard time obeying God. It's not just us. It's not just our children. It is a challenge that has existed as long as humans have walked the face of the earth. Let me start with the personal, and then let me move to the more universal. I can remember as a child trying to figure out, right, how to get my way and still operate within the parameters I had been given. How to get my way and to still not get in trouble for not disobeying. Now the instructions were always clear. Do not go outside. You better be home before the street lights come on. I think y'all grew up in a home similar to the one I grew in. Do not turn on the television or the radio until all of your homework is completed. Do not leave one single dirty dish in the sink. I think y'all know my mom and daddy. Do not even think about 
having any of your little friends over if I'm not right, if I'm not home. Those are just a few of the ones I remember. You probably have some to add to my list. We can compare notes after church. And to a greater or lesser degree, we were successful, right, in trying to obey. Some of us, our backsides were the evidence of how well we had or had not obeyed, but that's another conversation. So it really should not come as much of a surprise to us that if we as humans struggle with obeying our parents, our grandparents, our teachers, and our caregivers, whom we can see, then obeying God is another challenge altogether. Literally, from Genesis to Revelation, the whole Bible has more stories and teachings about obeying than we will ever be able to study all of, even if we go to Bible study every week from now until the Lord calls us home. And it starts right there in Genesis. I hit on this last week. Here was the first man and the first woman. We know them by the names of Adam and Eve. God had spent six days preparing the earth and the world for these humans the way God wanted it to be. God did not skip any details. God did not overlook any important nuances. Beginning with the words, let there be light, the Bible captures all that God did to prepare a world that was worthy of God. After spending six days creating and making the world exactly as God wanted it, what did God do? God rested. Then on the seventh day, after God had majestically created the Garden of Eden, the Bible tells us that God created you and me in God's own image. The Bible says in Genesis 1:16 that God says to the man, the woman was not yet created, check that when you go home, God says to the man, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil, and you shall not eat of that tree. For in the day Come on, Bible readers, that you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. Hey, I'm, I'm in some good company today. In other words, Adam and the not yet created Eve were allowed full run. You see this, right? Full run of the Garden of Eden. No limits, no restrictions, no prohibitions, no ordinances to remember, no community codes to be mindful of, no community improvement association protocols to have to check on. They had only one thing they could not do. They didn't have to make sure they set the garbage out at the right time. They didn't have to worry about having the snow cleared by a right time. They only had one thing they were told to do, only one. The tree of the knowledge of good and of evil you shall not eat, period. No discussion, no appeals, no negotiation. That's it. Story over. And so what do you think Adam and Eve did? As soon as they had a chance, the only tree we're told they eat from is the one they were told not to eat from. Obeying has been a problem for a long time. But doesn't this sound like your testimony and my testimony? Doesn't it sound like our bio? We knew what we should have done. 
and we decided not to do it. We knew what we should not have done, and we went ahead and did it anyway. Maybe this is what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Romans 7 where he says, For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do is not what I want to do. Now, if I don't do what I want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. It's been a problem for a long time. This business of obedience becomes the defining issue in the text before us this morning. As the opening scenes of Exodus unfold, we are reminded of what happens when a people forget their history. Exodus 1, 8 says it succinctly, now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And because he did not know Joseph and did not know the contributions of Joseph's people, the new king set about trying to erase slavery from the textbooks. The new king set about building walls to keep only certain people out of the country, while others could still come through Ellis Island freely. And the new king began sending immigrants with one-way tickets to New York and Boston and Chicago where there were black mayors. You see, oppression was the order of the day, all because of a fear of people who were different. And the new king automatically defines these people as other, unfit, outsider. And the problem is that he comes up with a strategy that is a strategic failure. Exodus 1, 12 tells us this, but the more they oppressed and the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. Okay, somebody's had that experience, haven't you? You've shown up and somebody looked at you and they said, oh, you, you know the sound you know the look when they were expecting somebody who did not look like you or sound like you and there you are showing up and just like the Egyptians began to dread the Israelites so folk have begun to dread when you show up and say I know the Lord has sent me here to be a witness to what God can do now enter Shifra and Pua. I would imagine that if we were to have had a spelling bee, Deacon Kennedy, seven out of ten might have gotten the spelling right before today. But here's what we know about them, absolutely nothing. We don't have any record of where they went to school. We have no sense of who they were related to. We know nothing about what their preferences were. Would they have enjoyed the Super Bowl halftime last Sunday or not? We know nothing. We learn about them, though, because in an attempt to undo what God has put in place, Pharaoh says, make sure that whenever you see that a little boy is born, that you kill him right away. These two sisters, I want to call them sisters, I, I, I've seen Shifra and Pua in my life. You've seen Shifra and Pua in your life. When folk had decided you were not worthy, Shifra and Pua came along and said to you, don't worry about what they say about you, baby. You keep on keeping on. Folk have tried to discourage you from living into the God-given gifts that God has placed in you and prepared for you. They were the ones who said, baby, God has not brought you this far to leave you alone. Shifra and Pua have been with us through our lives. They were the ones who would just stick a little piece of something, something in your hand when you graduated from sixth grade and got promoted to seventh grade or when you graduated from high school and got your first job, they would just come by and say, baby, keep on keeping on. That was Shifra 
and poor. Shifra and poor have always been that tag team group who showed up just when you were about ready to give up. And they said, come on, I know you can do it. Just pull yourself together because God is still in charge. Well, in Exodus, what Shifra and Pua do is they obey God. That's, that's their testimony. They obeyed God. And here's what happens because they obeyed God. And here's what happens when we obey God. First, when we obey God, we decide that we're going to participate in that which gives life, especially those whose lives are at risk and for those whose lives are at stake. In other words, when we obey God, we demonstrate that lives matter. It would have been easy enough for Shifra and Pua just to go along so that they could get along. They could have easily decided that everybody else was going along with Pharaoh's program, and they could too. But there was something in them that said, no, we cannot obey insanity. We cannot obey nonsense. We cannot obey the, the unjustified murder of little boys in our community. Shifra and Pua said, no, we're not going to do it. We are going to obey God, and we're going to show in our living that life comes from God, and therefore we value everybody who comes into our lives. I don't know what was in their upbringing. The Bible doesn't tell us. I don't know what made them do what they did, but here's what I can tell you. I'm glad they did what they did. I don't know who their Sunday school teacher was. I don't know what their favorite song was growing up. I don't know who their youth group leader was. The Bible doesn't tell us what choir they sang in. The Bible doesn't tell us if they were in a choir at all. The Bible said, though, that they chose to obey God. They decided that whatever anybody else was doing, they were going to stand on the Lord's side. Now, I live in, in Baltimore. You live in Baltimore. And, and we are watching. And this thing is just so painful. We are watching. As we are choosing to obey the NRA. As we're choosing to obey the the makers of ghost guns. We're choosing to obey the, the purveyors of drugs and the stuff that kills our people. And today, beloved, I, I, I believe that why God would not let this passage pass is because we just might need to raise up a whole new generation of Shifra's and Pua's. Folk who are not bound to continue to be as others have been in the world, but those who said everybody's baby is my baby. Everybody's child is my child. And if they can't find a way to make it anywhere else, they can count on me to be one of the ones to see to it that their lives matter. Second, they obey God, and when we obey God, we decide that we will be intentional about doing all we can to preserve this present generation. So I, I must be the only one who listens to these reports. We couldn't get from Monday into Tuesday last week without the story being made known that a little girl who goes to Mervo had been shot, that yet again there was gunfire. So for those of you who are here for the first time, and the, the cedar is in the roof, and the people who built this church knew that the cedar needed to breathe, and so when the wind comes along, what you hear is the cedar breathing. The roof is not falling. <laughs> Y'all stay with me now. We learned this week that in at Michigan State University, 
Families were worried, again, because of the death of people on campus after a shooter had gotten loose on campus. Today, we've learned that in Memphis, today, there's been yet another random shooting. Beloved, we've got to say enough is enough. We've got to stop supporting and hiding and covering for people in our community who want to kill our children off. Shifra and Pua said, I'm not going to let Pharaoh do it. And we've got to make sure we don't let anybody else do it today. Shifra and Pua said, we've got to not only preserve the present generation, We've got to make sure that the six and seven year olds get to grow up and get to have life like we have. We need to make sure that the 12 and 13 year olds get to grow up and go to school without having to worry whether they're going to need a bulletproof vest to get home. Shifra and Pua said, no, we're going to do this thing. We know what you want us to do, but, but we're going to do this thing because we're concerned about demonstrating that if God could send life into this world, that God has equipped us and prepared us to preserve life, not just for the current generation, but for generations yet unborn. Hear the song we just sang, yet with a steady beat. Have not our weary feet. Come to the place for which our parents sighed. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter. And we have not come this far, this long, to kill each other in the streets. Shifra and Pua said, we're going to obey God. We're going to be intentional about doing all we can to preserve the present generation. Thirdly and lastly, when we obey God, we commit to purposely standing for who and what we believe, irrespective of who doesn't understand it and who doesn't agree with it. In other words, when you choose to obey God, you commit yourself that if God says it, you're going to do it. And it doesn't matter who doesn't like it and who doesn't agree with it. One of the challenges facing the church today is we want to be liked. Social media has given us that word reformatted and now we think that we can't take positions that might not get us liked. Somebody might cancel us. Somebody might decide that they don't want to be connected to us. Well, you know what? Maybe we need to get accustomed to getting canceled because God wants you and me to be the people who show that there is a better way that there is a godly way and there is a holy way. And maybe you just got to get used to folk not liking you, folk not agreeing with you, and folk not understanding you because you decided that you are going to obey God, that you're going to make God first, that you're going to see to it that God's will is done in your life. When we obey God, we say, I'm sorry, you may not like it, you may not agree with it, you may not understand it, but I'm going to stand right here and I'm going to love the Lord, I'm going to serve God's people, and I'm going to do my best to make sure that everybody comes to know God in the pardon of their sins. And we do have a role model. We do have 
an illustrated example. If you are able, a little bit later, when you get home, after you close the book on Exodus, turn to the book of Philippians. Chapter 2, round about the fourth and the fifth verse, you'll find these words, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming, here it is, obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him to the highest place and given him a name that is above every other name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess. And Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. But guess what? It all begins with obedience. Because Jesus obeyed, you and I get the right to eternal life. Because Jesus obeyed, you and I can walk in the newness of life because Jesus obeyed. We don't have to worry about what folk in this world might try to do to us or say about us because Jesus obeyed. He's given us the example. He's given us the blueprint. He's given us the design. All we have to do is obey. We used to sing a hymn in the old church, Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Obey is not out of fashion. Obeying is not out of what we ought to be doing. Obeying lines up with God because God is going to make death obey one day. Those of you who have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and those of us who trusted him, one day when we close our eyes, God is going to make sure that death obeys God and God will raise you up. God will raise me up. God will give us a home on the other side where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. When we obey God, We can go through and come out on the other side saying, I know the Lord will make a way. Oh, yes, he will. I know the Lord will make a way. Oh, yes, he will. And if you find yourself in the moments of uncertainty, all you got to do is just remind yourself by saying, yes, he will. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. All because you obey and follow God. There might be somebody under the sound of my voice today who has not accepted the invitation. Who's not decided to follow Jesus, to follow God. Who's not decided to give your life over to him so that he might transform you and change you as one who understands that obedience is a sign of strength. Obedience is a sign of trust. Obedience, not weakness. Obedience is a sign of God being in charge of our lives. So today as we get ready to extend the invitation and to Open the doors of this church. 
If there's someone in here under the sound of my voice who does not have relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, or if you don't have relationship with a local church, if you don't have relationship with a people who are trying their best to be disciples of Jesus Christ in the world, whether you are in the room, whether you're joining us online, as we stand to sing this familiar hymn of the church, we invite you to come. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear. We invite you, if there's one, we invite you to come to sing its word. Is there one? It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love. Is there one who will come today? We invite you. Oh, how I love. Because he first is there one, is there one online? We invite you to join, we invite you to come. Oh, how I love. invitation is still extended. We invite you. Oh, 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 oh how I love him. Oh, oh how I love him. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because one more time the chorus, we invite you. Miss, we will greet you at the back door. Please continue until we have had a chance to make an official decision. Please continue to guard your health, particularly when you are in crowds. Wear your mask. Uh, don't hug nobody. You don't know where they've been. Make sure we keep one another safe. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit Rest, rule, and abide with you now, henceforth, and even forevermore. Let all of God's people sing together. Amen.